Hillman Realty provides real estate services in Santa Clara, San Mateo, San Francisco, and Contra Costa counties. Whether you're getting ready to buy or sell, in the middle of it, or just looking for some answers, we are here to help. Our goal is to provide the best insight, tools, and deliver the best financial results. Our innovative listing plan benefits our clients by providing a full-service MLS listing without paying the high real estate commissions. Our home buying plans are also designed to pass huge savings to our buyers. To learn more about our special offers and services, please either visit our website, www.ramanrealty.com, or contact Raman Mirzapur at 408-499-8957. Email raman at ramanrealty.com. Pay the lowest fees, sell for the highest price, and net maximum proceeds. are so excited to kick off our API Assyrian National Conference today with all of you here with us. Forgive us for the Assyrian delay. Um, <laughs> this morning we were caught up in Congress with a meeting with Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. Uh, we are so pleased to be here and without further ado we'll have more formal welcoming remarks throughout the conference but I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Ms. Carmen Murad, who is a commissioner in Stanislaus County uh, to kick off our advocacy day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shlama Lochon. Peace be upon you. Isn't that what that means? What a beautiful way to greet one another, right? Um, I am so proud to be here today. I would like to thank all of you for being here today, but in particularly the Assyrian Policy Institute for organizing this event, for inviting us as speakers and our distinguished uh, panelists that you will see later on. Uh, in this conference. I would also like to thank board members, uh, especially a dear friend, uh, someone that I look up to, Ms. Ishtar Sayadi. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't want to name too many names so I can forget, but uh, because Ishtar is from my district, from Stanislaus County, from Turlock, and we've been able to do a lot together. So um, I also want to make a comment without sounding too um, personal here, but I see a lot of young women here. Yes. And can we have a shout out for that? No offense to the guys, there's a lot of nice looking guys here too, different age groups. But how exciting is it to have the future of our nation, uh, the future moms that will be teaching their kids, their sons and daughters, how to live as Assyrian Americans in this country. So I'm very proud to be here today. So I've been invited to speak here, um, obviously for advocacy. And what advocacy looks like in the Assyrian community, and I can share that with you based on my experience. What does advocacy mean in our community? Um, 
A little bit about me. Um, I am a planning commissioner for the city of Modesto, which is an appointed position. I'm not like Altura, I wasn't elected. <laughs> um, I'm also a county commissioner, meaning that the Board of Supervisors appoint you to a position, and I take it just as seriously. So when I became the chair of the Equal Rights Commission in Stanislaus County, it was, it was a proud moment because I was able to carry a member of the Assyrian community to that level, to that um, commission. And one of the things that I was asked to do, which was a culture and diversity event, which meant that I could bring the Assyrian community as a part of a very diverse celebration. So I said to them, you want me to bring 6,000 years of history in a dolma dish? <laughs> we can't do that. There's more to us than that. So it was um, music, it was culture, it was food. But I knew there was more than that that we could do. So as the years went by, and, and I want to start with that because culture and food is very important. It's part of who we are. It's how we represent ourselves. It's how we celebrate ourselves. But I knew there was more that we could do. So as with each position, with each appointment, city, county, state, whatever, uh, voter registration, the census, the redistricting commissions, all of those things meant to me that that was one step that I could elevate within whatever opportunity that I had that the Assyrian community was at the table as an advisor, as someone who was a decision maker within each committee, within each commission. So what I would like to do here, um, there's a lot to say, but without taking too much of your time, what I would like to talk to you is the framework that I follow, because I'm also a contractor with Stanislaus County. I founded the Assyrian Wellness Collaborative, which is a collaborative that concentrates on the well-being of the Assyrian community. How many of you have heard that? We talk about politics, we talk about conventions, we talk about music, entertainment, but when do we ask about the well-being of our people? We are a people of immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers. We all know what happens to our nation. And whether you're first generation or second generation, we're always talking about the struggles because we cannot forget about them. However, what gives us strength to go on, right? So I follow the framework of community capacity building, which is a real strategy that our county uses. We define what a community is. A community is defined as a group of people with similar backgrounds, heritage, shared experiences. In our case, we know what they are. Capacity building is finding a way to navigate through the system to help one another become productive members of society. Now, it's a fact that more Assyrians live in diaspora than in our ancestral homeland. All of you here are an example of that. Whether you were born and raised here or you came to this country as a young person. I came here when I was 12 years old. I was fortunate enough to remember home, but I was also, I want to say, more fortunate. I was young enough so I could acculturate quicker, that I could find the way. And all of you know what I'm talking about when you're children of immigrants? You become the translator. You become the one who answers the phone. You're the one who, um, you know, reads the letters when they come home, right? So we know that um, we have to help one another. We know that. We learn it as a, as a young age. Now, one of the things that we also concentrate on through advocacy that I believe is important is preservation and advancement. Preservation has to do with culture, heritage, language. We're speaking English today because we're in Washington, D.C., right? But how important is it to keep our language alive and practice it and speak it and teach it to our kids? Now, the advancement part is what we're here to talk about. Advocacy means what? To be an advocate for your cause, for your vision, for your culture and community. 
And the settlement in, in the United States, or I want to say Central Valley where Ishtar and I are from, and I know Dr. Ariane Shaya will teach us and educate us a lot more in detail on that because that's what she does as a professor. It goes way before World War I. But what we do know that we Assyrians, we own our communities. We become productive members of society very quickly. We acculturate. We learn the language. We become business owners. We become entrepreneurs. We become educators, professors. Uh, we open up our television stations. We become important business people. But what we need to work on when it comes to advocacy is to mobilize our community. What does that mean? Mobilizing a community in today's world means civic engagement. For those of you who watch my program, and I'm sure some of you have, the premise of what I do is civic engagement, meaning become informed. By becoming informed on issues that matter to you, you are able to make informed decisions. Attend city council meetings. Attend your county supervisor's meeting. And if you have kids in school, attend school board district meetings. Find out how your local government works. Volunteer like me. I was a professional volunteer for a long time before I, before I got a contract out of it. Um, but also, being connected to Assyrian organizations is important. We have the perfect example here. My friend Rochelle is here, and she will tell you. Every Assyrian organization is bound to uphold its bylaws. Preserving the Assyrian language, heritage, and culture are the core values of every organization. As Assyrian population increases and grows, so does the need for local advocacy to improve the quality of life for our seniors and for our new arrivals from war-torn war countries. Don't forget, we have Assyrian refugees arriving, whether they are, and, and Ishar will tell you as she was working for the congressman's office, there is such a need for help. People might not come up and ask you, but if they have an issue with immigration, they need to call someone within the federal government. I get the calls. I used to work for Assemblyman Heat Flora. That's state government. So state government has to do with unemployment, Department of Motor Vehicles, insurance. That's what I mean by understanding how your local government works. Understanding the needs of the community members and providing cultural competency and sensitivity. That's one of the, one of the things that I do uh, as a contractor with the Wellness Collaborative. Our culture, how we are raised, it determines how we reach out for services, especially with the stigma of mental health, of well-being and wellness. It was not easy to start the conversation on wellness and well-being, to talk about anxiety and depression. Not easy. I took a lot of attacks for that. But I know that we as human beings experience things that we need to talk about. So that's one of the things that we need to understand to reduce stigma and increase awareness on issues that impact our everyday life. The other thing about civic competency is make sure your personal political views and agendas, they can be counterproductive to the cause of the entire community. I know it's election season, people are passionate People really want their views for, to be everybody's views. And if you're going to be an advocate for an entire community, you need to make sure that you're somewhere in the center. You can never change anybody's mind. So we can always do more. I'd like to share with you. Um, remember in the beginning I told you that I started with food and dancing? And then we ended up with this. In, and I'll pass this around, in Stanislaus County, which is where Ishar and I are from, and I don't know if we have someone else from Turlock, Modesto series, everybody knows where those two cities, three cities are. We did voter registration drives. As you know, voter registration is when you sign up to register, 
and from a resident or a citizen, you become a constituent. When you become a constituent, you are on the radar of your elected officials. You have a voice now, right? Your vote is your voice. So the more we got people to register to vote, we got the attention of our elected officials. As the population grows in Stanislaus County, and we are quite a base where we are able to make or break elections. There's two ways you can get the attention of our elected officials. If you have money, you write big checks. That will get your attention. But elections are won by votes. In small communities, believe me, everybody wants to, even if it's within 10, 20, 50 votes, she's laughing, she knows. So all of a sudden, I get a call from our voter registrar about six years ago. Carmen, we want to talk to you about ballots being trans translated into the Assyrian language. Can you imagine what that felt like to me? We are a population that we don't have a country. We don't have a governance we still have to explain to people that we're Assyrian and not Syrian. So imagine, due to this relentless advocacy, voter registration, ballots, these are official ballots that taxpayers paid for. And, I'm, and I wanna pass them around. Every elected official's name, bio, every proposition, is translated into Assyrian. And that's a very proud moment. And we also, um, again, with food and dance, we started. We ended up with our ballots being translated in our language. We ended up with Assyrians being on advisory boards for the redistricting commission. I was on the complete count committee of the Stanislaus County Census. And I really have to mention this. We got a contract to produce public service announcements in Assyrian for the federal government. And who did the Assyrian part? The one and only Ishtar Sayadi. <laughs> so I emailed Ishtar and I said, I have a script for you. I have a contract with the county CEO's office. And we, I want to bring a cameraman to the congressman's office. They opened the door for us that day. They were closed. There was Ishtar and there was the congressman talking to the Assyrian population about the importance of participating in the census. So imagine how far we can come. If the advocacy is done in the right way, it's not just asking for something when we need it. It's continuous work. We have to be so productive and proactive. That way, when there's time for us to need something, the established relationship is there. We just need to sustain it. So that is something I'm very proud of. And also working with our state legislature in California, Assemblyman Heath Flora, he did two resolutions for us. One, the most important one, culturally is Khabnisan, right? Assyrian New Year. The other one was August 7th, which was, um, as we know, it's Martyrs Day, but it also created a platform to raise awareness on genocide awareness. My friend Rochelle and I were talking earlier about, imagine in the past 20, 30 years, how far has this advocacy for genocide grown? What she does amazing things in the Bay Area and San Jose. We do it in the Central Valley. And I'll never forget, when we were doing um, genocide awareness events at CSU Stanislaus and Turlock, that's when Ishtar and Congressman Josh Harder said, we would like to introduce your own resolution in Congress in House of Representatives. I wanna take you back. We started with dancing, food, and culture. Advocacy grew, advocacy elevated, and personally to me, I want to share with you, every position, every appointment, every opportunity to me was a step to elevate my community to a higher level 
so we can be taken seriously, we can be taken and given a seat at the table as advisors to our local government. And that's the beauty of advocacy to me. It could mean something different to you all, but I can share with you, when you see these ballots, when you walk into a vote center in Stanislaus County, particularly Turlock, you know Turlock is the epicenter of all Assyrians, over 120 years of history with Dr. Isaac Adams and his family. In fact, at the end of June, there's going to be an Assyrian genocide exhibition that you will hear more about its organizers in this conference this week in a few days. So advocacy is important. Be an advocate for your identity, for your heritage, and your culture, and you will see results. And I'm going to end there because there's, I know there's questions. Uh, please go ahead and ask if you have any questions about uh, the ballots, if you have any questions about where you live, if you've attended any city council meetings, and if you see someone gets a proclamation for Filipino Day heritage. Uh, Asian, as you know, we just had Asian and uh, Pacific Islander Month. Where you live, and I know this is a very diverse group, do you have anything like that where you live? Yes. In your city and your county? You said yes? Who was that? Please share with us. Um, recently, I'm from Metro Detroit, where the, there is a predominant Chaldean Assyrian population there, um, and they recently recognized for the month of April um, Chaldean month, Chaldean years or something. That's fantastic. That means they went through the city council. Uh, was it a particular organization that did that? Um, I'm not familiar if there was an organization specifically, but um, it was announced on April 1st, so part of New Year, and it was a great celebration for me. That's fantastic. So every year you have to keep up with that. There's opportunities to do it at school district meetings as well. There is a uh, public session um, time when you can do that. I, if I happen to be on the planning commission at the meeting, and this last year we were, and I took the opportunity to wish everyone a happy new year, and I said it in Assyrian. So every opportunity to advocate for your community, take it. But learn how to do more. I think we can always do more. We can learn from those who have done it before us. And if there's a festival, Make sure there is a booth for the Assyrian community or the Chaldean community. And it starts with food and dancing. I started with food and dancing. And the more you participate, the more you learn. Read the items on every agenda. Ask questions. Make motions. Make sure your motion is heard and passed. That's how the Assyrian community becomes a serious base in every community. And that's when people start running for office. We have people that <laughs> um, we need to support our candidates who run for office. I know we have individuals here who have endorsed and written checks for those campaigns. We must support. We need to have uh, another congressperson other than Anaishu. Ana She's been there for quite a while. We need our men and women to run for office. And how do we do that? by making sure there is a support system to make sure that we all know how to do this and how important it is with our peers, associates, and colleagues to be proud of who we are and represent our community wherever we are. Thank you so much. Was there any questions? Yes, Dr. Ishaya. Uh, I'm very thankful and very impressed with the ballots and the Assyrian language, but in order for people to read that script, mm -hmm. they need to be literate in our language. Yes. So are there any preparations for establishing the serious language, Assyrian language classes <coughs> in the area where you live? Excellent question. Thank you, Dr. Ishaya. As you know, our churches constantly have schools uh, in our language, whether it's young children or older. Um, we, we did used to have a class at the Assyrian American Civic Club. 
that stopped because our teacher retired. However, we did a program, uh, and Ishtar, you were there, with Rabbi Yulius, yes. where he created a self-teaching of the Assyrian language, and he gifted it to CSU Stanislaus. And we were there when that event happened and that ceremony. So anyone who, who wants to learn the Assyrian language on their own, they can do it online through these books and through these videos. And I agree with you, there should be more classes. And the only way to preserve this language is through teaching it. Because we speak it at home, but to be literate in it has to take teaching and classes in a systemic, organized way. Yes? Yes, ma'am, and by the way, Hashirutha uh, um, for this uh, amazing, like, ballad in Surat, uh, which I have yet to read. But uh, um, I came specifically for the purpose of going to the revitalization breakup session and following up on what Radhika um, Ayana said. Um, like, I, I'm aware that there have been some efforts to get Assyrian taught in public high schools in Chicago. Point is, there are currently textbooks available that, even if they're not the best, they can be used. Whether it's Rabbi or um, Haiko's book, or whether it's Anwar Ato's books, the Nishani series from Australia, as long as there is a competent person, uh, competent people in the community who get some sort of teaching accreditation or authorization to teach in the public school system. I think it would be very feasible for Tarawak to get a Sura taught in school. I mean, I wonder if that has been thought of. Very good like, question. Like credit, like, I mean, like yes. Class, there was a history of it, and it was done yeah. in Turlock High School years ago. And right before <laughs> COVID, the Turlock Adult School actually had a class, and and all of its t uh, students were non-Assyrians, and they were learning conversational uh, uh, Assyrian. Yeah, but what you're talking about is more of a serious, systemic um, proposal. Yeah, with the curriculum there. With the curriculum and to go through the school board, mm -hmm. and that is a very complicated thing to do. At the universities, it's done, where they teach it. However, within the school district, um, that, that's another story. You mean as a second language or as a real curriculum? I mean as a real curriculum that's a foreign language you study just as if you were studying Spanish. That's quite a task. And that's when you need to have someone who has the credentials, who has the backup, and who needs to submit and go through the channels at the school districts. Yeah. And, and to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping someone will do it. Because the population is there. We have schools in Turlock where we know that uh, there is such a high percentage of Assyrians that uh, identify themselves as Assyrian because there's a question. Just like with the voter registration affidavit, when it asks, we're not talking about race. We're talking about identity. This is what the census teaches us every 10 years. There's a difference between identifying yourself as your race your heritage and your culture. And if you noticed, if any of you participated in the 2020 census, they, they were combinations of multiple races and multiple uh, backgrounds. And that's when we had the opportunity to write Assyrian. Race is different than heritage and culture. And once we understand that, we will know where we use which, right? And that makes a huge difference. We were writing Assyrian on the Stanislaus County affidavits. And how do I know that worked? Because in the Modesto B, there was an article from the, uh, Lee Lundergan, who was the previous voter registrar. Um, I believe it was 2016. There was a young man by the name of Matthew Jacob who ran for the Turlock City Council. His campaign was amazing. They registered 500 people to vote. We were, I was there every week at the Assyrian American Civic Club waiting there for, to register people. We told everyone to write in Assyrian, right? And we knew it worked because in the Modesto B article it said there was a high increase in voter registration in ethnic immigrant communities 
especially the Assyrian community. That's when we said, whoa, people listen. People actually listen to what we were telling them. And we use the same strategy for the census. And because Stanislaus County is so unique, we have, I think, I want to say 12, 13 churches in Turlock? 13, 13 churches in Turlock. And that's not counting series in Modesto. Um, you drive down a street in Turlock, you will see the Assyrian flag. It's, it's a very proud thing on bakeries, on businesses, on stores, on grocery stores. That's called community ownership. When, when uh, Vito Chiesa, who is our district supervisor, he uses one thing, he says, Carmen, you are such proud people. Pride is good, but what do you do with it? What do you do with it and how do you, through the proper, proper channels, can get your ballots translated in that language? It's an acknowledgement that we are a base in that county. And I bet all of you in this room either have a relative who lives in Turlock or know someone who <laughs> lives in Turlock. So make sure you tell them to vote when it's election time. Make sure you tell them to register to vote because it does make a difference. Thank you for that comment. Um, Jump in, uh, really quick. Yes. So we will talk more about that tomorrow. Um, Carmen is going to be around all weekend. I'm sure she'd be happy to speak to you all if you have additional questions. Um, and Carmen, we're going to have sort of a networking session later tonight. So if you have additional questions, uh, she'd be happy to take them. But we do have to move on just because we're short for time. So. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for being here. everyone. Can you hear me? I feel like I have to bend down a little bit. Um, every time I follow up Carmen and she talks about me, I'm like, can I just carry you around? She always <laughs> makes me sound so good, but she also neglects to tell you that I've, I learned a lot of what I do from Carmen. So she's amazing. I'm going to take a little bit of time here to talk about what we can do as a Assyrian community to, or how rather, we can communicate with our members of Congress, especially since we are here in Washington, D.C., and we had an amazing group go to Representative Schakowsky's office to, to talk to their representative. And then we're going to be heading over to the Hill again to speak to my former boss, Representative Harder. So I just want to talk to you all about how we as Assyrians can use our voice and why it's so important for us to be heard by our representatives in government. We want to talk about what the issues are that matter to us and why they matter to our, our representative. Because if we don't speak up, our representatives aren't going to know what we need or want from them or what kind of representation we expect from them. So we want to talk to them th about things like the genocide bill and why it's important to our community. Uh, not just in the United States, but the repercussions of having the United States recognizing the victims, the Assyrian victims of the genocides, the recurring genocides, and how that's going to affect international relations. So community visibility, as Carmen so beautifully put it, and engagement means recognition as a minority, which brings various benefits from the federal government all the way down to local governments. For example, the beautiful ballot that's going around that's in Assyrian, and the efforts in the state of Illinois right now to have Assyrian be offered as a language class. Again, we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. But the more we speak up, the more we connect with our representative, the more we're heard, the more we, we are represented in our government. The more we matter, the more we're valued, and we're taken care of because every community, including us, have special needs. A little bit about me before we proceed, but Carmen covered it pretty amazingly. I worked for Congressman Josh Harder for about two years. I was a constituent services representative and manager. And I was able to uplift a lot of the Assyrian um, issues, the things that mattered to us, to him, which was an amazing opportunity. So I, can, I have some experience in the area of contacting your congressman or congresswoman. Sorry, I thought I heard my name somewhere. So let's talk about how we can contact your representative. 
So it's very, very easy to get in touch with your member of Congress. You can either email them, snail mail them if that gets your thing, or even call them if you're more comfortable with that. The contact information is easily accessible online. When you call or write or email, whatever it is you prefer to do, provide your name, address, and contact information. And the reason you're being asked for your contact information is because they might give you a call and be like, hey, you called about this issue. Why should I sponsor this bill? Give me more information. Why is it important to your community? The best way to structure your call is to first give your personal information, specify what you're calling about. For example, we want you to sponsor resolution 550. And then very briefly explain why they should take that action. And that's it. While you will not be able to speak with a representative directly, your messages are all accumulated together and then provided to the member of Congress and that's going to affect how they vote for something or how they sponsor something. So every call, every email, every piece of snail mail they get is aggregated and presented to the member of Congress and it affects how they vote on things. And it's not just the Assyrian issues that we want you to call about. Call about everything else, every other bill that matters to you and let them know you're a member of the Assyrian community because your name gets written down. So to wrap up, all of your messages are going to be collected. Every single message you leave behind is going to be heard by a member of Congress. Even if you don't speak directly to them over the phone, the messages will get across. That's how we advocate. That's how we speak up. That's how we make our vote count. That's how we are heard and we become the voices of our community and those who don't have a voice anymore. Especially with this genocide bill that we've put forward, we encourage you to call your member of Congress. Tomorrow we're actually going to be leading an entire like mass call text to your member of Congress asking you to sponsor <coughs> Resolution 550 to recognize the victims of the genocide. That's how we become the voices of the people that were massacred. That's how we bring our history, our voices forward. And that's how we advocate for ourselves and for our people and our community. And I'm so excited to be here with you all. I'm looking at this room and like Carmen pointed out, it's all young people. We're Assyrian. We're in Washington, DC with this gorgeous view of the Capitol. And we're Assyrian, we're here, and we're going to be heard. Thank you all so much. Thank you.